Next up, we're delighted to have Dr. Bill Lazonic from the University of Massachusetts Lowell talking about the real super predators. Where's Bill? Here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about the causes of uh, despair, uh, predatory value extraction. So let me take you through this ride. We want to get sustainable prosperity, stable and equitable growth. Uh, we don't have it. Uh, we have very unstable growth, uh, um, <coughs> uh, inequitable distribution of income, and, and as you can see here, concentration of income at the top. Now, the way you get a strong value-creating economy is through what I call the investment triad. Households invest in the future uh, labor force, governments invest in infrastructure and knowledge, and businesses invest in value-creating products uh, and processes that generate the, the, the competitive products that give us, in fact, value that uh, we put into our pockets. Now, the way we get a uh, sustainable prosperity is some balance between value creation and value extraction. And basically, it's workers who create the value get that out of these companies in the form of higher wages, uh, benefits over long periods of time. Uh, Government, uh, which invests in knowledge and infrastructure, get that back uh, through co corporate taxes, uh, which reimburse government to invest in uh, infrastructure and knowledge and get involved in the next round of investment, which is actually always greater than it was before in terms of having a prosperous economy. Okay, the problem is that we've gone from uh, these three uh, organizations, households, business, and governance, I call them investment triad, investing in productive capabilities, to predatory value extraction. Uh, and basically what happens is that once you have successful companies, and these corporations are at the core of our economy, they're big gold mines, pots of gold, and if someone can go in and grab them, that pot of gold, and take it out without creating value, then that's what we get. We get predatory value extraction, and it is all over the place right in front of us. And basically what I'm going to argue is we have to stop that first and then we can tax the value-creating rich. And I think what we have here, hopefully, are more value-creating rich than predatory value extractors. Uh, but even if we do have some of those here, maybe they'll uh, uh, help us out. Okay. Uh, now, you have the uh, growing productivity gap, uh, which is well known from EPI. Uh, wages tracking productivity in the post-war war two decades, and then the big gap, gap growing. Uh, that gap uh, is uh, the place where the predators prey. And there I show a crocodile as a predator. Uh, uh, and here I show that predator waiting uh, to take the value that's created in some workplaces here. And uh, they take it out through stock buybacks if it's a publicly listed company. Uh, and if it's a private company, uh, it's private equity comp firms loading company up with debt and then taking it out in dividends. Okay. The, uh, you can look at that uh, that relationship between pay and productivity in terms of two eras, one which I call retain and reinvest, uh, which dominated. Companies are retaining profits, which are the foundation of capital investment, uh, retaining uh, workers, and reinvesting in their productive capabilities. Uh, that was really the general experience post-World War II. It was a white male's world, however. Uh, we've now transitioned over the last few decades to what I call downsize and distribute. Uh, you downsize the labor force, squeeze wages, outsource labor, and distribute that cash to shareholders. So the foundation of the old model was career employment with one company, which we used to have. Now we have unstable employment. We have massive distributions to shareholders and uh, loss of middle class employment opportunities. That also shows up, if people here well know, and we've talked about, in the changes in the tax rate. The old system, uh, the those who were making the gains were helping to support the investment in productive capabilities. That's all changed. We now have basically what, uh, in the corporate sector, what I would call a buyback economy. That's what companies have, uh, are about, and I'll show you some of the numbers on this. So these are the same 226 companies over the period 1981 to 2017. At the beginning of the period, uh, about 50% of their earnings went to uh, 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 dividends minimal to stock buybacks. Uh, at the end of the period, the same companies as for 2015 to 2017, it was over 50% to dividends. Those had gone up somewhat. It wasn't that they'd gone down. But buybacks were now over about 
of net income. So they're actually paying more than, than combined than 100% of their profits uh, uh, to shareholders. They're doing this often now by borrowing money uh, in order to do buybacks. Companies are doing that all over the place. Okay, uh, if you can see this, these are the uh, top 25 uh, repurchasers, 2008-2017. Uh, uh, most of them are spending more than 100% of their profits on distributions to shareholders, mostly buybacks. Uh, there are companies like tech companies that are no longer innovative. Uh, there are pharmaceutical companies that are price gouging in order to get profits up, in order to pump up their stock prices. That's what it's all about. Uh, there are banks that are screwing their customers in there. You can see number 24, Boeing, which is spending uh, tens of billions of dollars on stock buybacks uh, to build planes that crash, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, the Republican tax cuts, they exacerbated this. Even the Republicans didn't argue that people, companies were going to do buybacks with, with the tax cuts. They just thought that's great. Okay, last year, 2018, $800 billion uh, spent by the S&P 500 companies. Those were records. This graph shows that each quarter of 2018, the amount of stock buybacks went up. Okay. This is, uh, occurs because the SEC allows it to occur. It's a direct result of the election of Ronald Reagan in 1981. Uh, an obscure rule, 10B18, uh, used to be obscure until I started writing about it. It's really a license to loot. And this is the only, this is a headline from the only Wall Street uh, uh, article that appeared in the media at the time. And it basically says that the SEC assures companies that if they do buybacks, uh, they won't be charged with manipulating the market. They give them a safe harbor against doing this. Uh, this is, shows the amount that these companies, these are the 10 largest repurchases I showed you before, can do in uh, any single day uh, within the safe harbor by Rule 10b-18. So for uh, Apple, it's about $1.4 billion a day. Microsoft, $730 million a day. Uh, many companies, $200 million a day. They can do it day after day after day. We don't know when they're doing it. The SEC doesn't know when they're doing it because we don't know the precise stage. There's all kinds of insider trading going on around these buybacks by top executives and, and hedge fund managers who know when they're being done. Also, companies can't violate Rule 10b-18 even if the SEC ever looked into whether they were exceeding it because it's a safe harbor. They can just avail themselves of it. And the SEC has never, ever investigated how much stock buybacks companies have ever done on any single day. Okay. Uh, Who's doing this value, uh, predatory value extraction? So I have an analysis coming out in a book called uh, uh, Predatory Value Extraction. It's insiders, uh, enablers, and outsiders. The insiders are top executives who become focused on their stock price, uh, who are paid mainly in stock, and who bump up the stock price and, and make the gains. Uh, Institutional investors, fund managers, who are chasing those quarterly earnings, compared and hired and fired on that basis, uh, they are enabling this process, and they're enabling it through something that I think people know very little about, but they should know more about, a very corrupt proxy voting system that the last group, who are becoming increasingly powerful, a very small group of people, uh, I won't start naming them, but it could in, in, in about 10 seconds, uh, <laughs> uh, who uh, can get less than 1% of the shares of a company and tear that company apart. Uh, uh, Nelson Peltz and uh, GE is a good example. Uh, a great example, an unfortunate example. Okay, they are the ones that are actually using this proxy voting system uh, to influence a board members, to get people on boards or influence the people there to move from, if they are there, from innovation to financialization. So these show the data collected on the stock-based pay, the realized gains uh, of uh, the 500 highest paid executives for every year from 2008 to 2017. Uh, you can Perhaps see the numbers there, it ranges up to about 20 to 30 billion, a million a year on average. And the bulk of it, the orange part and the purple part, 80% about is uh, stock-based pay, stock options or stock awards or realized gains. And growing uh, amount of institutional investor uh, um, uh, pension money, mutual fund money is uh, controlled by institutional investors who under the proxy voting system not only get to vote the shares, which is a questionable practice, but have to vote the shares. And uh, then the uh, shareholder activists, the ones, if you can see them, that are underlined here uh, are the ones who are actually going into companies and ripping them apart. Uh, they end up making the top executives envious, at least the, the top 15 we have here for 2016, with about five times the take-home pay of the highest-paid corporate executives. 
Uh, now, the ideology they use for this is uh, maximizing shareholder value. It's a theory of value extraction, and not value creation. Investment in productive capabilities is what makes economies strong. You have to look inside the companies, which we do uh, when we look at uh, the, these large companies and we get down into the weeds in terms of what these companies are doing, the, the, the damage that buybacks do. When we look at what are these strategic uh, uh, managers doing, what kind of uh, investments are they making, uh, what kind of organizational learning is going in the, on in those companies, and how is finance being used in order to sustain that learning process so we have a productive company and productive economy. And predatory value extraction basically undermines all those conditions. And finally, uh, uh, what do we do about it? Well, uh, we have to deal with corporate governance. This is something that Americans have not wanted to deal with. We have to deal with what companies do, how they're governed, who's on their boards, what purposes they have. We have to get rid of the predatory value extraction. So we have to know what those practices are, who they are, how it's done legislatively. And then we maybe will be left with value-creating rich who will be willing to pay high taxes, as many people have said here, not uh, uh, because they see them fair because they make them richer, but because they're fair because they're in support of goals of being a humane and just society. Thank you. Thank you.